fratricide, jealousy, and Afrocentricity. I loved New York then. It was a hotbed of intellectual activity. Black intellectuals were actually respected then. A black intellectual is a freak today. White folks don't recognize them, and black folks, well, black folks don't even know black intellectuals exist. These words by John Jackson were said in 1982 from his apartment in a nursing home in Chicago, Illinois. They highlight the disappointment and loneliness most true African-American Afrocentrists experience as a result of years of disappointment and disillusionment. Jackson had come to Chicago to teach at Northeastern Illinois University Center for Inner City Studies in Chicago. It was then called the, the Comedic Institute. The Comedic Institute was located for the Center for Inner City Studies. He claims he was fired by the so-called elders who managed the Comedic Institute because he was an erudite scholar who blasted both the communist and pseudo-black nationalists at the Comedic Institute. This treatment of Jackson, a true scholar, was not new to Afrocentric scholars. James Spade, in his essay on the life and times of Drusilla John G. Houston, mentioned Houston's discussion with an established black historian about her work, in which she recalled that, I remember in the beginning of my work, for I believe in counsel. I wrote to one of these characters being paid a salary to encourage the advancement of Negro history and receiving a grafty, fearful letter shooting me off from an association banded supposedly to advise and encourage students in Negro history. Historically, most African-American Afrocentrists have not been formally trained or are not affiliated with a university. This results from the fact that most black elites are anti-black or feel inferior to white scholars. This has resulted from the fact that black elites, for the most part, are non-nationalistic. W.E.B. Du Bois observed that the upper class black is almost never nationalistic. He wrote, he has never planned or thought of a Negro state or a Negro school. This solution has always been a, a thought up surging from the masses because of pressure which they could not withstand and which compelled a racial institution or chaos. Continually, such institutions aimed at providing African Americans with pride were founded and developed, but this took place against the advice and best thoughts of the black intelligentsia. Yes, that's one of the reasons why many of the so-called black colleges, they don't even have a black history program. They don't even have an African studies program. It is pathetic. But these black people, although they uh, run universities, run colleges around the country, they create no place where black people can learn about their history, where black people can learn about their culture. Carter G. Woodson believed that the failure of black American elites to initiate consistent and aggressive academic competition with whites resulted from their feelings of inferiority. Participation in the middle enslavement of blacks and general miseducation. Carter G. Woodson wrote that the Negro's mind has been all but perfectly enslaved and that he has been trained to think what is desired of him. The highly educated Negroes do not like to hear anything uttered against this procedure because they make their living in this way and they feel that they must defend the system. Few miseducated Negroes ever act otherwise and if they so express themselves they are easily crushed by the large majority to the contrary so that the perception may move on without interruption. These words are though written <laughs> Many years ago, they still exist today. Most of your Negro intellectuals, the so-called black intellectuals, African-American, Afro-American, whatever you want to call them, they never write about black people doing anything of accomplishment. They always wait until some European, some white person says that black people did something before they even think about, about doing any research and writing knowledge about us, about themselves. There's also self-hate among Afro-American scholars. This self-hate among many Afro-American scholars is highlighted by the fact that they only recognize black scholars whose work has been published by Europeans. I repeat, most black people do not recognize another black person's work or an Afro-American's work or an African work or anybody that's brown or dark skin unless Europeans say it's okay. Unless European gives it the thumbs up. 
As a result, many educated blacks fail to respect black scholars who are not associated with the university or use their own money to buy their way into Afrocentric field by publishing their own books and attending every conference they can. Many of, the re many of these so-called black scholars, professors of anthropology, history, and other things at universities around the country, black and white universities, many of these scholars are looking for white recognition and fail to really love their race. Wilson has made it clear that these scholars need to learn to love themselves. Dr. Woodson wrote that if the highly educated Negro would forget most of his untried theories taught him in school, if he could see through the propaganda which has been instituted into his mind under the pretext of education, if he would fall in love with his own people and begin to sacrifice for their uplift, if the highly educated Negro would do these things, he could solve some of the problems now confronting the race. I quote, the hate and disrespect blacks show Afrocentric scholars in their attempts to uplift the race and inspire them to greatness is quite disappointing and has left many of these scholars lonely and bitter. According to John Jackson, Dr. Nathan Huggins, a great African-American scholar in the 1930s, committed suicide in 1940 out of frustration that comes from trying to help black people. Jackson observed that, and I quote, I tell you, black people are just a bunch of consented slaves who would rather sit around collecting food stamps and go to church, some idiotic church on Sunday, than to struggle for dignity. Zero Neil Hurston, one of the greatest folklorists of the uh, 20th century, this black woman did so much to, uh, to, to return to us our legacy of, uh, of telling stories. I remember my auntie, she used to love to tell us many stories like Bro Rabbit and other things. And many of these stories are our roots but we had forgotten them. But Zora Neale Hurston was often admonished for being too nationalistic by her peers. Alice Walker has noted that Zora's pride in black people was so pronounced in the, in the earth's stat of black 20s that it made other blacks suspicious and perhaps uncomfortable. After all, they were still infatuated with things European, everything European, I quote. Although Hurston was the author of two books on Afro-American folklore, four novels, 50 essays, and short stories, she was never offered a position at one of the Negro colleges. <laughs> and she died a as a common maid, yes. This one was such a prolific scholar, such a great researcher, just a great woman, period. And yet she died as a maid, cleaning homes. There's a double standard in the black community. Whites who write about blacks are seen like blacks are lionized. African Americans, on the other hand, who write about the greatness of blacks are vilified and in many cases their research is not respected because many blacks don't believe that African-American scholars are as capable as white scholars. John Jackson again noted that. Jay Rogers told me once that he was sorry as hell that he took up the cardio for black people. The more you try to help, he told me, the more they try to hurt you. And now I see that he was absolutely right. Look what black people did to Marcus Garvey. Garvey wanted to uplift the masses, but most black people, especially black leadership, want to exploit the masses, even most of the masses themselves. If they ever got a chance to exploit their own peers, they could do it without a moment's hesitation. End of quote. This is sad. You know, and here it is in the, uh, in the years, in the 2000s. Yeah, we don't have any black leaders. There's no major black leaders out there. There's nobody uh, speaking up for the race. Oh, but let DACA come or let some other uh, 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 non-Afro-American uh, have a problem. Oh, you see black people, black leaders running all over the place to try to speak up for them to save them. Save the race, baby. Think about yourself sometime. Since the late 19th century, when Booker T. Washington described the relationship of blacks as crabs in a barrel, I blacks try to keep one another from advancing due to jealousy. Because of jealousy, many African Americans refuse to respect other African Americans. As a result, unless the white establishment publishes an African American's work or gives an African American a professional job, every other black believes she, he knows just as much as every other black person. This is especially true in the Afrocentric history field, where the same people who read the literature want to write it. This is sad because it leaves very few individuals around to just read Afrocentric literature just for enlightenment. Harold Cruz, one of the great uh, political scientists of the uh, 1960s and 70s, argues today, and I quote, that black intellectuals, quote, 
are less productive than the group between 1930 and 1960 because this group was self-centered and products of the me generation. And this is true. Where's your Afrocentric research? I'm really embarrassed that I have to write most of the books and do most of the research articles on Afrocentric studies. I have to do the research in genetics, history, linguistics. Why? Because we have all of these so-called Afro-American professors, many of them with tenure, and some of the major universities in the United States are doing nothing to write about the race, unless they're waiting for some Europeans to tell them what to do. The self-centeredness had limited the effect of Afrocentric research in world, on world history. The selfishness, false pride, and conceit of many Afrocentric scholars I've known over the past two, two decades indicate that some members of this group are trying to find his or her place in the sun. Rather than stra strengthen the Afrocentric field of research, as suggested by Sheikh Antad Yap, in his lectures and writing. We find that these scholars fail to work together. This has led to the absence of basic Afrocentric research at a time when the Afrocentric curriculum is becoming accepted in many secondary schools. And, but they have allowed reactionary Eurocentric forces to mount a successful attack on Afrocentrism. In fact, many, uh, <laughs> many uh, Afro-Americans believe <laughs> don't even uh, want to support Afrocentric researchers because they believe that, aha, that's <laughs> not proper. Sad. This had one columnist for a local newspaper in Chicago to lament, and I quote, when young thinkers like the great Mr. D'Souza, himself a front man for the right wing cause, and a scholar, <laughs> quote unquote, especially useful since he is a person of color. He is an Asian American of Indian descent and can rail against black studies and the blackness of ancient Egypt, where are the scholars who have the Egyptology down and their D offshore. But where is the scribe? Where is the wisdom of the ages? Where are the leaders, the thinkers? Well, from the university, we shall find no direction. Isn't that sad? And I quote, isn't that sad that you cannot count on the, all these Afro-American, African-American, whatever you call them, professors with tenure, with tenure, with tenure. It is pathetic. It is pathetic that we do not help each other. It is pathetic. As a result, I have found that other Afrocentric scholars will read my papers and write their own papers based on my research, and not even put my papers in the reference section of footnotes. Many Afrocentric re researchers are backstabbers and two-faced. In 1982, for example, when I deciphered some Maya ins inscriptions, Ivan Van Sertima refused to publish them because his friend, Barry Fell, <coughs> disagreed with my interpretation. As a result of this action by Sertima, I gave up my associate editorship of the Journal of African Civilization, and I refuse to give Sertima any more ideas for future issues of the JAC. I've also worked with black people who try to pretend they are nationalistic to the public, but behind the scenes they are all sellouts. Many blacks like Sertima try to try to wide fence to be on both sides of an issue at the same time. These individuals are very willing to cooperate with white supremacist forces working under the guise of liberalism, if they can be legitimized by Europeans. It begs the question, why is it hard for many blacks to identify with members of their race? The answer appears that the American education system, this system of education affects both the so-called Uncle Tom and the nationalist blacks, because both fail to respect competent African-American researchers. Woodson wrote, and I quote, the same education which inspires and stimulates the oppressor with the thought that he is everything worthwhile depresses and crushes at the same time the spark of genius in the African American by making him feel that his race does not amount to much and never will measure up to the standards of others. Quote, unquote. Even though these words were written over 60 years ago, they still ring true. For example, even though Leo Hanberry had taught African history for years at Howard University, it took him 25 years to get tenure. 25 years! And in 1959, when the Ford Foundation established one of the first African Studies program at Howard University, Hansberry was excluded from the faculty. This is an indication of the lack of respect that some blacks and authorities show research in their African heritage. Think about that. Howard University is supposed to be the standard university, the premier, premier Afro-American black college, and yet they wouldn't even give Leo Hansberry tenure. They wouldn't even let him teach African studies, but they brought in all these whites and Europeans to teach black people how to think about themselves. 
African American scholars as a rule fear competition with white scholars due to a lack of confidence. As a result, except for this book, most Afro, except for the books that I've written, most Afrocentric research is based on research conducted 100 years ago. Moreover, even though Diop called on researchers to use his research as a springboard to other research topics, except for French-speaking West Africa, black scholars have failed to expand on his research. Where are the, uh, where are the works written by Afro-Americans? Dealing with uh, West African linguistics or Egyptian linguistics. No, they repeat Diop, but they don't do the research themselves. I had to do the research. Come on, people. Come on. Help us out here. This failure to pursue well-organized study of Afrocentric themes have allowed the Eurocentrists to deny the validity of Diop's work in the United States without any scholarly struggle from the Afrocentric establishment, like the former Gematic Institute. Today you hear people all the time saying, you hear the, uh, the Eurocentric Euro nut saying, ah, Diop was a bad scholar. But they never show where, where his research was wrong. And yet you see these same young, black, Afro-American, African, whatever, American, whatever you want to call them, researchers, instead of them reading Diop's work and trying to see if he was right or wrong, they just go along with whatever the other dogma is. And they uh, hate Afrocentrism and hate Diop too. This jealousy must stop. Afro Afrocentrism can only advance if we work together. In summary, jealousy, envy, and arrogance has made it difficult for us to fully illuminate the greatness of classical African civilizations. I have written this and made this video with the hope that we will learn from the past. Disrespect shown Zora Neale Houston, J. Rogers, and others. For Afrocentricity to be fully implemented, we must put aside our desire for individual fame and work for the greater good. The greater good in this case is a careful documentation of our past so our children can have the knowledge and self-respect necessary to meet any challenge that they will meet throughout their lives. Aluta continua. Let's fight, baby.